So hi everyone, I'm Dr. Steph. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Toronto Faculty of Medicine, where I teach financial literacy and transition to practice. I'm also on Instagram and YouTube as Breaking Bad Debt. Today I'm joined by Dr. Shala Veda, and Shala completed her residency in family and emergency medicine at the University of Ottawa. She practiced emergency medicine and suffered a concussion, so that resulted her switching to family medicine. Um, she experienced a lot of burnout in that environment and then switched to becoming a GP psychotherapist and started the Yoga MD. Then in 2018, she experienced another concussion, which caused her to have to take disability leave. So her side hustle being the Yoga MD has now become mostly her main career. So in this interview, we're not just going to talk about disability insurance, but the whole financial aspect that comes with losing your main source of income and having to pivot your career. So I want to start by talking about your life before the disability happened. What made you choose family medicine and what was your day-to-day -day life like when you became a family slash ER doctor? That's a great question. Um, you know, when I was in medical school, uh, I thought maybe pediatrics, maybe OBGYN, and I couldn't really decide. And what I realized as I was going through my rotations was how important, like pediatrics left me, like I was treating the, the kid, but not the, I wasn't the parent's family. Like I couldn't, I wasn't their doctor. So I couldn't really affect the family relationship and OBGYN. I missed kind of like, I, well, first of all, I, the most important thing was sleep. I needed sleep. So it became very clear to me because I actually switched in my residency to doing OBGYN for a while and then switched back to family practice that my sleep tolerance wouldn't allow me really to, to do that for very long. Um, and then I loved family because there was so much you could do. You could do uh, the relationship with um, with the the child, the parent, the grandparent. Uh, you could do you can deliver babies. You could do emerge if you wanted to. And I really like the flexibility of family practice. And I still truly believe it's it's the best job to be somebody's doctor and to to know that family and watch those kids grow up. It, it's a it's a really beautiful job. So uh, I'm hoping that we save it yet again. I know there's a lot of changes that have affected family practice. Uh, but I hope it comes back to being the beautiful job that it was when I started. Yeah. You were kind of doing uh, locums when you started for a couple of years. Um, did you just do full time yeah. emerge or did you kind of split your time family medicine and emerge? Well, so I did emerge as um, I did like part time emerge with uh, locums in family practice and I actually went up north. So I worked in Moosonee, uh, Moose Factory, the Moose Factory Zone, Kishashawan, Attawapiskat, Fort Albany, that whole area around the James Bay Coast. And I learned so much about trauma, about health, and how when we lose our culture, how it affects. Um, how it affects our well-being. And that actually inspired me when I came back. I was working Emerge, but then uh, when I left Emerge to do family practice, I was working in Mississauga with a large South Asian population. And my experience working in the First Nations communities really helped me understand what was also happening in the South Asian communities around um, being an immigrant, losing culture, uh, and not being connected to those ways of being that kept us and that's really when I started to bring yoga and even Ayurveda to my practice. And when I talk about Ayurveda, I'm not just talking about, oh, you take this herb or you take that herb, because that's really not what it is. It's more about understanding your constitution, what's in balance and what's out of balance, foods to choose and avoid, how to live a healthier lifestyle. So it was very much lifestyle medicine. And because my last name, Vedya, means uh, Ayurvedic physician, I would get a lot of South Asian people coming to me kind of expecting both the, you know, the, the Western medicine and the Eastern medicine. So they'd be asking me, you know, should I be eating kitchari? Should I be um, doing this or that? And um, I realized the importance of retaining those cultural rituals and those cultural ways of knowing your health. And, and that kind of, the, you know, that's the seeds were planted in family practice for the later practice of the yoga MD. So yeah, that's kind of the nutshell. Um, that's really yeah. interesting. And so um, it sounded like you started doing yoga um, around the time that you started practicing as well, right? Like when you were already a family slash emergency doctor. So, um, you know, what kind of, uh, so when it comes to burnout, um, how did yoga really help you with that? Well, you know, at the time, I don't think I understood the science behind it. I do now. Um, 
I actually started my yoga practice in medical school because I just needed a break from something. And a friend of mine saw a yoga class on um, on our on the schedule for, uh, you know, for the sportsplex or the, the Dowplex, it was called. And we used to go and I just, it just, I didn't know how it worked, but I knew I felt better after. And so throughout medical school and residency in residency, coming home and doing yoga, I, you know, at the time I had a VCR player, a DVD player, put in a tape and I would just do it. Um, or put in a CD, a DVD. I know I'm aging myself now, so I apologize to everyone who thinks I'm really old, but that's uh, that's what it was. And it really helped me. And as I started to burn out um, from Emerge, I did it when I started to burn out in family practice. And I was working in a toxic environment at that time. I went back to a yoga practice that was quite close to my house that just allowed me to release the stress that was in my body, allowed me to kind of come back into being aligned and made me feel good again. And, um, you know, it was really funny because at that time I was teaching my patients um, meditation and yoga, you know, gentle yoga moves, not a whole hour practice, but maybe a coordinate the breath with the breathing and the moving. And one of my patients um, had said, oh, this is mindfulness, Dr. Vadia. And I was like, mindfulness, what's that? And I looked it up and I was like, oh my God, there's a whole body of research around this practice and how it regulates the nervous system and brings us back into alignment, how we can release from the body. So I knew that kind of my next step would be taking this forward. And what was so interesting is I remembered when, because, you know, when you start medical school, you have an idea of what you want to, you have an idea of what kind of doctor you want to be. You don't, might not know what exactly your specialty is, but you have these values and, and these ideas of what you want to be. And then, you know, you get into the, the thick of medical school and it's like, holy crap, I got to learn all this information. And then you start, you know, your rotations and it's like, it takes so much of you. Like, I feel like I lost a lot of myself um, just trying to survive. Like looking back on it now, I was totally in survival mode. Um, and it's like, what do I need to do to get ahead? How am I going to, what is it that I love? Who am I need to impress to get into whatever program? And, and you really start to, I really start to lose myself. Um, and, you know, when I started doing yoga again with my patients and realizing this is what I want to do, I remembered my first year of medical school, one of the things I wanted to do was bring Eastern knowledge to Western medicine. And I even wanted to do my first year project on that. And I remember going to uh, the dean, uh, who's a wonderful dean, Dr. Jock Murray, who started the Humanities and Medicine program at Dow. And he's like, you know, this is fabulous, but you can't do that here where I was at Dow. And I'll tell you, that was 1995. So, yes, I'm I'm ancient. It was before the turn of the century. But, um, you know, I heard you can't do that. And I think what he meant was you can't do that here, like here at that time in my medical school, because at that time, John Kabat-Zinn was starting to publish on mindfulness. Dr. Richard Davidson was starting to do some work. And it's it just, um, you know, when this all happened, I kind of just fell into the yoga MD. Like I was working in a toxic workplace. Um, it wasn't working out for me. Our executive director was stealing money. I was the... Oh. Whistle, yeah, it's, it's a big, long story. I was a whistleblower. And this just goes to show that when you get into a practice, you think it's just going to be, I'm learning how to practice medicine, I'm going to go out and practice. But there's actually things you have to think about in terms of running the practice, the administration, who's doing this, who's in charge of things. Um, and it's, it's very easy to want to just be, I just want to focus on medicine, because that's what I'm trained to do. But we do have to learn the business aspect of it, as I know you're you kind of bringing that out with um, Breaking Bad Debt. Um, and so I was kind of on the trail of this and it ended up that um, the executive director kind of turned the other physicians on me, the co-lead and the lead, and uh, built a case around me. I ended up getting locked out of my office. Oh, my. Very interesting. Yeah. And when I called CMPA and CPSO, they told me this was a um, common thing. I was given a severance according to my contract. So, and I was able to take my patients with me. So there was a few things that were okay, but there was a lot there that we're not going to get into, but yeah. um, I was burnt out from that, not from the patient care, not from, you know, that type of thing, but actually working in a toxic environment where uh, I was being micromanaged by management. And so was this it, in like a CHC type of model? No, this was in a faux fit. So a oh, family okay. health organization and a family health team. Although people who have worked in CHC models where there's a separate administration, yeah. 
have said that they've had the same issues. So apparently this is common, but I've also had physician colleagues who have experienced this amongst other physicians, like the physician who is the co-lead and whatever. Right. So working in a, um, an environment where there's toxicity, where people are playing each other, you don't think this is going to happen in medicine because we feel so al altruistic, but it does. And you do have to watch out for that. And my advice is if you get yourself in a bad situation, know that it's a bad situation, leave. It's not you. You got yourself into medical school, which means you're stellar. You'll get yourself through. Um, and if something's not working out for you, it's okay to leave and move to do something else. Uh, yeah. And I probably learned the hard way, but after so many years in practice, because I was really worried about my reputation, like what will people think of me? Oh my God, I got locked out of my office. And I didn't really tell anybody for about six weeks. I mean, obviously I told C the CMPA and I was lucky because I trained in Ottawa. So the person I called was somebody who knew me, who you know boosted my confidence right away and reassured me that this happens all the time, more than we talk about in medicine and in careers in general. And um you know, and he kind of counseled me through that. So I felt good. And once I started talking about it and telling people, I realized how common it was and other people supported me and everybody knew I was in it to innovate healthcare and to do a good job. And so it didn't affect my reputation at all. Well, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. So that that's my, I know that's kind of off topic, but it did cause me significant burnout at that time. I didn't claim disability. I'd gotten a good severance package. So I took my time, but I really stopped and asked myself, you know, what is it I want to do? I felt like I was on this rat race of practice, pay off debt, establish myself, you know, do all these things, change healthcare. I even did a master's in, in public health and health management because I wanted to change delivery. And we were doing that in my family practice. Um, but when I stopped and asked myself what I really wanted to do that, and I knew that mindfulness had so much um, research behind it, I knew that's where I was going to take the yoga MD. And the yoga MD started off as a stress-based practice because, uh, you know, we talked about me using yoga with my patients. I started to use it with the patients I was screening for the adverse childhood experience score. Now, I didn't know at the time, but when I, um, I was teaching them, but then when I started to screen my patients for adverse childhood experiences, I realized all the people I was, all the people I was teaching yoga to were the people who had high adverse childhood experiences. They had dysregulated nervous systems and there was nothing in the Western medical toolkit that was helping them. And so, you know, that's how I was like, okay, I'm taking this forward. I'm going to build the yoga MD. I ended up working with a lot of physicians, nurses, social workers who were burnt out and a lot of patients with chronic stress um, or metabolic diseases, inflammatory diseases that were kind of not well explained by the medical model that worked really well in the um, yogic and Ayurvedic model. And so I, again, gained, you know, my, my, the doctors in my community saw what was happening and, and kept referring people to me. So yeah, it worked out. <laughs> and just for like those people in the audience, we are, we've used terms like CMPA. CMPA is basically the medical malpractice insurance that we pay into. And they have like lawyers who can help defend doctors in the case of medical malpractice. And then CPSO for students who are listening is just, um, you know, if a patient has a complaint around a doctor or something like that, they can report it to the CPSO or the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario. Um, so in terms of your yoga training, did you have to do any additional like certification, mindfulness courses, anything like that to, to get more experienced in it? Yeah, for sure I did. And I think I mentioned I got a severance package with when I came out of, uh, yeah. of my toxic work environment. And so I, you know, after about six weeks, I did go back to work in a, um, in a walk-in clinic that was close to where my uh, practice was. So I was able to see my patients. I worked with some other eMERGE docs. It was very hilarious. We always say there's a 10-year uh, a 10 year time, like, you know, the average eMERGE doc burns out after 10 years. So at one point I was sitting in the, in the staff room with uh, two of my other colleagues that graduated the same year I did out of eMERGE. So we laughed about that. Um, yeah. And I, what I did because my schedule was flexible, I was working some, I actually traveled to India to study with Savasta Yoga and Ar Ayurveda. And I looked it up, um, Savasta, the people who do that trained with Krishnamacharya, who is the guru who trained Iyengar and Deskacharan, many other um, well-known yogis. And Ganesh Mohan, one of the teachers, was a Ayurved, trained as an Ayurvedic physician and had an MD. So he was kind of breached, um, kind of did both. And he understood 
uh, the Western medical model and how to incorporate it with the Eastern medical model. And so that's why I picked that program. And so I did my yoga teacher training with them. And that was wonderful because everyone who was in that group was about my age, kind of having a career shift. Uh, so we were a really great group kind of rethinking life. Um, and then I started my yoga therapy training, which is higher level than uh, just being a yoga teacher. Not that there's anything wrong with being a yoga teacher, but kind of going more into a systems approach or a whole being approach, looking at uh, how yoga can help people live better lives or achieve well-being. So, and how yeah. long was that? You were there. You were in India for a year, or no? <laughs> I was only in India for like six weeks. Oh, and, but wow. so I did so I did the yoga teacher training and then started um two modules or I don't know if it was one or two modules of the um of the yoga therapy and then I went came back started to work again um I did and then the other mod modules Ganesh at the time is coming to the U.S. so I was traveling to the U.S. for a week or two to to catch up on the other models so I could get them all done but I started my yoga practice before because I you know as an MD and as a family doctor as a family doctor as a generalist you understand so many presentations and how people present what their issues are you understand the physiology and, you know I had a good I had a at least 10, yeah, 10, 13 years under my belt of practicing. So it, um, it, it came naturally to me. I also did the mindful-based um, cognitive therapy training. So that teacher training. So I understand their model and, and as so I was practicing and doing trainings at the same time. Yeah. And then I did the mindful self-compassion course, which uh, with Kristen Neff and Chris Germer, and that changed my life and it changed how I wanted to change medicine as well, like bring back that compassion piece, because that can really help um, with not just the burnout, but with how we treat ourselves. We get to be so hard on ourselves in medicine, beating ourselves up. And, we're you know, we're in a tough situation um, and compassion can really help. Self-compassion is, is definitely a lifesaver in those moments. So definitely. And so speaking about tough situations, let's fast forward to around 2018. That was the time when you got your second concussion. And so in that experience of disability, can you talk about like what happened and what was your daily life like afterwards? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, this was life changing this accident. I had a bike accident. So it was just biking on the streets, biking to yoga, had my helmet on my tire cut a rut in the road. And I went sideways before I could get my other foot was out, but my left foot was, it wasn't clipped in, but it was in, in the tie. So I couldn't break my fall. And um, yeah, I you know when it, I initially hit my head, I knew it was bad, but I was still able to get up, get myself to yoga. Um, I just didn't understand what the course of that was going to be like. I assumed, you know, three weeks, maybe six weeks, like I'd seen with many of my other patients or my own experience with concussion. And it was completely different because I tried going back to work and I didn't have the, like my brain would just like stop working. And, uh, you know, I learned so much from my patients at that time. Cause you know, one of my patients said was like, oh, my brother went through this. It's going to take a while. See you later, Dr. Vadia. And, uh, um, and I realized I needed to take time off. And so I taken time off, went back to work, took more time off, went back to work. Uh, we have about, you have three months before you can apply. Like in, there's a 90 day like the elimination uh, period, elimination right? yeah. period for your, for your disability. And then you apply within, you can apply within that time or close to the um, end of that. I can't even remember. And I remember at that time, like I, you know, my brain was such that I didn't even know, like I had the paperwork, I'd sign forms and I didn't even really know where to turn. So I called my financial planner from who I'd bought one of my insurance policies from. And then I called the, I had the OMA plan as well. So I called them and I was just like, I hit my head and I need disability insurance. And in those moments when you're that sick or injured or ill, you don't really have the capacity to fill out forms. I mean, many of us find those forms difficult to fill out just on a daily basis, but I had no capacity to fill out those forms. And with the OMA, they sent somebody over to my house uh, to fill out the form. And um, he took one look at me and, you know, he said, you need to have, you know, when he comes, you need to have uh, your last three years of income because they either take your best year or combination of two years. So I can't even find that now, but for the love of God, I knew where those, my bookkeeper or, you know, my Excel sheets were for those things. So I remember bringing them down to my dining table and laying them out for him. And he was looking at them and he was like, okay, pick your best two years. And I was looking at this Excel spreadsheet and for the life of me, I could not see like 
January, this income, like it was a sea of numbers, a sea of letters. I couldn't process anything in my brain. And I just flipped out in front of him. It's like, I can't, I can't read this. It's just all I can see is numbers. Like I don't see where the years are or the months are. And he could tell I was really struggling. And he was just like, all right. <laughs> he filled it out. He picked the years and he asked me if I had own occupation. And, you know, I was a, a family doctor doing a merge when I bought my plan. I think I was before my third before doing the third year or maybe I bought it in my third year. But I thought, well, I always can fall back on family practices, which is what everybody thinks. Oh, I'll just go back to doing this. And so I didn't have own occupation. And he said, for sure, if you're surgical, surgical um, can't, um, uh, profession or your ER, you really need to have own occupation to protect what it is you're doing. And so and just to clarify for the audience, own occupation is basically like, if you can't do the regular duties of your job description, then you would still get that payout from the disability insurance. But, you know, there's the own occupation. The opposite of that is, let's say, like regular occupation. Uh, regular occupation is, you know, if you aren't able to do your regular duties of being a doctor or whatever, um, and you find something else to do, let's say teaching, which you weren't doing in the past, you can potentially still get a little bit of the payout, but not any more than had you, like you can't get paid more than what you were earning before. Whereas in own occupation, there is a potential you might get paid more than what you were earning before because you get the full amount of the own occupation of the um, disability monthly uh, amount that's paid out to you. But let's say if you happen to make more as a teacher than as a previous physician, then that gets added on top of that. So I just wanted to clarify that for you. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and it is really confusing because every plan is different in terms of how they define exactly. own occupation. And, you know, for me, I had residual disability because I went back to work. And so I have to submit my monthly income and they look at it and then they they give me an amount um, of what basically the loss was. But if I make within 20 percent of what they can what they're paying out, then I won't get I won't get the money. So it's it's. It's very interesting. And my understanding is that every disability insurance uh, or package or whatever you buy, it can be different. So you really do want to read that fine print in terms of what it is you're purchase purchasing, whether it gives you the ability to work after um, like come back and work even part time uh, and how it pays out. So yeah. it was interesting because I didn't have um I can't remember. I think one of them I had own occupation and then the other one, maybe it was regular. I can't really remember. So it sounds to me like you had two different disability insurance providers. One of them is the OMA or the Ontario Medical Association. Um, that's kind of like every province has their own, um, you know, medical association and they provide their doctors with uh, disability insurance. But was the other one that you had RBC, like a private company insurance? The private company was actually Canada Life, but Canada my, Life, okay. yeah, it was Canada Life. Um, I think they're in Manual Life now. I can't really remember. There's some things there uh, and it ended up being a good plan, but I probably didn't research it as much. Now I ended up getting the second policy later on uh, because I was at the time I was single. Uh, a friend of mine had just been diagnosed with cancer and um, and, you know, my financial planner was talking to me about critical illness insurance, um, disability insurance. And because I was single at the time, I was only one income. The disability insurance that you can purchase is based on your salary. But it's not like you get as much as you would have made a month with that. Like you get considerably less. So yeah. she sold me another plan saying this is lifestyle protection insurance. And I, at the time, you know, from when I had cancer, I was like, oh my God, I'm, uh, I think it was like 33 or 30, maybe 34 or 35. I can't remember how old I was. It may have even been 38. Um, and I was like, okay, at this time, I can't, I don't have enough in my corporation to kind of withstand how many ever years of disability. So I'll buy this this a second policy until I make enough money to not need a second policy. And then I'll, um, then I'll let it go, but just for insurance, insurance matters. And what was really hilarious before I, well, not, I think it's hilarious before I hit my head, like literally the Monday before I hit my head, I was going through my finances and I was like, huh, I'm spending a lot on this extra policy. I probably won't need it. And I was thinking about canceling that plan. 
And I didn't actually get the time to email my uh, my um, person, my financial planner to cancel the plan because it was the week before my vacation. I was so busy trying to wrap things up. And then the Thursday I hit my head and I actually ended up forgetting about that plan until the OMA guy came over or the guy who they sent over to help me fill out forms. And I was like, I have this thing too. What's this about? And he was like, oh, this is your other disability plan. You're going to get both. Because at the time I, it was you know, my ability to function and and understand because I had a brain injury was not great at all. I was having a really hard time with cognitive function, uh, multitasking and processing information. Um, and so, yeah, I called my financial planner. She was like, okay, let me deal with this. And then I basically filled out that form the same as the other one. Now, filling out the form was interesting. So a friend of mine, um, a colleague of mine, who she had been on disability before and her husband actually filled out the forms. So he actually uh, volunteered to help me out uh, to fill out some things because he knew the process. And that was, you know, at that time, I, I'm just so thankful for the people in my life that kind of stepped up uh, because... It, because it was just like, you know, you just don't know, like, am I going to get better tomorrow? Am I going to get a better in a year? What is this going to look like? And I I didn't assume that I would still be on disability. Um, I assumed I would get better. And, uh, and having a chronic illness, like it's now developed to a chronic illness, I understand better what it means to be disabled. Because, you know, in the past, I thought, well, if I do, if I can't um, practice medicine, I'll just do you know, if I can't do emerge, I'll do family practice. If I can't do family practice, I'll do GP psychotherapy. And at this point, it's like, well, if I can't do this, then I'll just become a yoga teacher. What was interesting is that because I was a yoga teacher and therapist prior to hitting my head, that was my own occupation right. when I hit my head. So it's not, oh, I'm an MD. It's whatever you're doing at the time that you uh, hit your head. So if you have a side gig, that is considered your own occupation. If um, if you are if you're disabled at the, like at the moment you're disabled, whatever you're doing becomes your own occupation. So I assumed this would be my side gig and whatever. What I hadn't um, what I hadn't understood was, you know, with my injury, I subsequently my migraines got worse and how living with uh, chronic migraines, how that affected my ability to work uh, was really interesting because, you know, they're, um, they, they're unpredictable. And so your function is unpredictable. And every time I went back to work, patients wanted to come see me. They had a waiting list. They want to see me. They want to see me in my full capacity. And there are times that I don't have the capacity to hold space for them. And I have to ask myself, is this really fair for this person? So, you know, I've, I've kind of rejigged my medical practice. I still focus on uh, the stress and, and burnout, not uh, the yoga stuff, uh, but I do it with concussion. And then my side gig is more the coaching, the speaking, the workshops that I run. And I've learned that I can do those at certain times of year when the atmospheric pressure isn't crazy and my migraines uh, get worse. So it's been a real journey in terms of learning about myself and what I can and can't do. Yeah. yeah. And often like when disability insurance brokers kind of give these talks, they don't really talk about the actual like practical side of experiencing a disability because it definitely sounds like you were overwhelmed with all the paperwork you had to fill out. You have probably had doctor's appointments to go to oh as God. well. Very mentally taxing. Yeah. I didn't realize how taxing a doctor's appointment was because, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm the doctor. I see everybody, everybody, you know, every 15 minutes, every half hour, whatever. But like getting on transit, getting to the doctor, waiting in that room, getting like I was done at the end of the, at the for the end of the day if I had one doctor's appointment. So um, yeah, it really gave me insight in what this feels like. Uh, it's not so much the illness, right? Or oh, you have migraine, or oh, you hit your head. It's the fatigue factor that comes when your body isn't functioning at its optimal level, and you know you have the rest of your life to to deal with as well. So it's um it's hard. It's been it's been an interesting run. I've learned so much. Um, and I do still feel I have a lot to give back to the profession because of this insight, uh, but it makes it difficult. Yeah. And so um, you have two disability insurance providers, and I know some residents or new staff physicians will do the same thing where they'll get, um, you know, partially put one foot in the door with the Ontario Medical Association and then the other foot in the door with RBC because they're both different types of insurance. So one of the OMA is the step rate, right? So it steps up every time you reach a certain decade of your life. And then let's say RBC or Canada Life, that would be your level rate. So it kind of stays the same rate throughout. 
Um, how, like, can you talk a little bit about your experience in getting the disability insurance payout? Because I know some folks have said like, oh, it's really hard to like with OMA, it's a bit easier, but with, let's say a private, um, company, it's a bit harder. Did you experience that? I did 100%. And I didn't realize it would be that much of a difference. Um, you know, the OMA is a bit more of an expensive plan, but it was designed by doctors for doctors and that made such a huge difference within that first two years of being on disability, because although it was, it's hard to fill the paperwork and actually get on disability. So even though you have a plan that may be 30 days, 60 days, or 90 days, you may think, oh, I'll get paid after that 60 days. But that first 60 days, you're not, um, you might not have even put in your application yet. And then there's a process of getting approved, right? So that may be more than 90 days. And so you have to have enough money in your in your corp or in your savings to pay for that time. Now, they will back pay eventually from that 90 day period, but it can take a while to get that. So that was one thing. Um, but the other thing with the OMA is the person that works with me um, works with physicians. She also works with pilots. So very specialized work. And she understood the job. So she, when I was going back to work, she was like, why are you going back to work? You need to stay off and get better and do these things. Um, and, you know, it was a little bit of a, a fight. But then when I came to the point of like, oh my God, I can't do this. She was like, yeah, you can't do this. This is okay. You, you know, that's what we're here for. Now, they also got me a business coach to help me with the yoga MD. They got me a rehab coach. Um, they understood how I was getting better. And then you have, you know, you're, you'll be on insurance for about two years and, you know, every year they'll do a, like, get all the notes from your family doctor, get all right. some specialists, what's going on. And you do still have to keep filling those notes out. So that that's, that's actually and quite all a those coaches were like free for you. Like they were yeah. covered. Oh, they wow, were covered. I didn't know that. yeah. Cause they knew that I would have this, I could do this side yeah. gig. But even after that, with the coaching, the coaching staff were like, your illness is going to actually prevent you from doing this the way that like they went back to the insurance company and were like, she can't do this. Like she can't do this at the level that she would need to do this at like being like coaches or her primary thing. So I, I had so much like, I'm so blessed that I had that plan because they understood me and they really went to bat for me. My other plan, Canada life um, was, it's a good plan, but it's not, it wasn't uh you know, they didn't get it. So after, you know, so I was filling out the paperwork, saying stuff. And then after a year, they're like, okay, that's it. We're not paying out. Uh, it's been a year. It's time for you to get back to work. See you later. And then I had to fight again, right? Like I had to be like, oh my God. And luckily I was a physician and confident. I was like, well, let me speak to you. Who, who's the physician who made this decision? And do they understand what it means to be a doctor with a head injury? Because, and, and you know, I challenged them and then they laid off. And then my, um, my neighbor's a lawyer. So they said, write on your plan or on the forms. And I do this for all my patients now uh, that, that obviously that fit the category. Um, it would, it would not be judicious, <coughs> excuse me. It would not be judicious for Dr. Vadia to return to work and risk malpractice. Because mm -hmm. one thing you learn as you're filling out all these forms, it has nothing to do with the medical side of things. We can fill out forms as doctors to say our patients can't go back because of this medical illness or that medical illness. What they care about is the legalese because it's the lawyers that are fighting for the money, right? So it's, you're, uh, I didn't need a lawyer, but um, that's where it comes down to is that if there's a legal reason <laughs> that they would be held accountable for, that'll be like, oh yeah, we don't want to get sued or we don't right. want the responsibility. So that's what that came down to. And Canada Life ended up following suit of what OMA did. I don't know what conversation they had, but I had to disclose to Canada Life that I had the OMA ins uh, insurance. They said they didn't want to do duplicate work, which is why they wanted to contact them. And then since then, Canada Life has pretty much followed suit of what the OMA Sun Life uh, plan. Now I think Sun Life has turned to Manual Life, so I don't know who's going to be taking that over. But um, yeah, they they um they followed suit so they still bother me more than the oma does or sorry than the sun life plan does but um uh but as long as i comply and you know the thing i do is if i see a specialist i'll get them to cc me or they'll obviously cc my family doctor on the note i get my notes ahead of time and send things ahead of time so that they don't have to ask me because it is a bit hard when you're trying to get better. And then all of a sudden, boom, this note comes out of the blue. Please send your um, latest thing so we can review it. 
Yeah, right, exactly. And just that, um, so we touched a little bit about the riders. We talked about own occupation, which is the most expensive rider. It comes out to be about 15% of your premiums that you pay on your insurance, but there's also cost of living adjustment or COLA and future increase option or FIO. Did you get those two riders as well? I did. So I got COLA for sure. You absolutely have to get COLA, the cost of living um, increase, because I mean, just look at what's happened in the last three or With four the inflation years. Going inflation going really, has gone yeah. nuts. And that has actually added $1,000 to my monthly um, benefit. Great. So it helps keep your monthly premiums at the pace of inflation. And then what about future increase? Um, what benefit did you see with that? I, I did. Um, so if I'm correct, future increase, uh, that's when I got the letter from the OMA saying, yeah. hey, it's time to choose. You can go up again. Without I, needing a medical. Yeah. Right. Now I was in a, yeah. And I think that's a good, a good, good thing to have. I don't, I must've had it because they sent me the letter. I don't think it was that much more expensive. So I think I bought right. it at the time. I never actually exercised that because, you know, it went from merge to family practice and then was locked out of family practice. And so my income actually went down with each step of, uh, <laughs> of my career. So I never got to actually increase increase it. But I would have, especially in my 30s and 40s, because, you know, for many people at that time, you have to, your expenses are increasing. You have, you probably have a house to pay for, or maybe your rent is going up. You may have a child, you may have, you know, future university things to think about. You want to put a lot, you know, you want to do your saving for later on in life. You want to do that early because one, so you don't get used to the money, but two, because as you get older, you're not guaranteed to have the capability to as work as hard as when you're younger. And I don't think I realized that until, you know, until like getting locked out of my family practice, until I started the new gig. And definitely after the concussion, I realized, gosh, you know, I'll tell you, I just recently turned 50. And I know that makes me sound really old and I apologize, but your body does change. Even if you're taking care of it, your ability to earn income as you go forward um, may become less or it may it may not become less if you kind of pivot and do things a little bit differently because you can always do things differently that maybe, maybe your side gig is giving you more money. But I guess what I want to say is your ability to work hard um, at your job may or your may be a little bit less just because you're older and you just get tired. Right. Yeah. How did you decide how much disability insurance to buy? Because there's some that are like, oh, well, you can buy 10,000 a month or 7,000 a month. How did you kind of decide that? Yeah. So with the OMA, they give you a salary. They're like, if your salary is this, this should be the benefit or this is the amount that you can um, purchase. So that's what I got for that. And then I think for Canada Life, it was a top up to what I would make after tax and after like after tax and after expenses on my monthly. Oh. And it wasn't quite the monthly. I think it was still a little bit less, but they looked at that number and then they decided, well, this is the benefit we could top you up for. Gotcha. Yeah. And did yeah. you get critical illness insurance? I did because at the time that I bought that second um, insurance plan, I think I told you I had a friend who was diagnosed, I actually had two friends diagnosed with cancer. And so it was really, um, it was really close to my heart at that time. I was in my mid thirties. And if you get a critical illness, you're, you're gone for, well, at the time I thought, well, I'll be gone for at least a year. Now I realize, oh my gosh, you're, you may be gone for that year, but then you're going to be on disability after, but your disability payment probably won't cover what the expenses that you're going to need in a critical illness situation. Um, you know, like you may need caregiving, you may need, at least you need someone in your house to clean your house. Like you're not able to do all of that stuff. So critical illness was really important for me to purchase in my thirties for sure. Gotcha. And in terms of like other sources of income, right? Like, did you, in addition to this disability insurance payouts, um, did you also look into like ODSP, the Ontario Disability Support uh, Program? Like, did you have investments that were coming in? Like, and also, did you find ways to reduce expenses as well to kind of account for the spending? Yes. So those are all really great questions. I didn't apply for CPP or which is Canadian Pension Plan or ODSP. Um, I, I mean, maybe I el I'm eligible. I don't know. But I kind of think of that as a. I, I didn't apply for it. I didn't think that was for me. Right. Um, I mean, I, I guess I, I don't know if I'm even entitled to it because I have the, the uh, private plans. Maybe I am. Um, I just don't know. So I just never did. Uh, and I also didn't believe in my head that I would be off this long. 
I, I didn't realize that. And I'm only your like I'm coming up to year five in July, which blows my mind. Um, I didn't realize it would be this long. So mm-hmm. that's I'm coming to a place of acceptance for that. Uh, but no, I didn't apply for those two things. And then in terms of I didn't touch my investments. I let them be. I was OK financially on my disability insurance to not have to take from there. I did have to take from my corporation. Um, so I did have to pay myself, um, well, it wasn't even dividends. It was like just trying to keep my practice going because overhead costs so much. Yeah. Right. And then, um, I, uh, I was just paying part of overhead. I, I wasn't, um, I think I was paying 30% or 20% overhead at the place I was working. Uh, I wasn't there full time. I kept coming back to work. And then my, uh, coworker who actually ran the practice got cancer. So he was off for a bit. So then I was kind of trying to do a little bit more. So it's, you know, it wasn't a cookie cutter kind of, well, this happened. So I did this or that happened. Then I did that. Um, but I did kind of run my corp a little bit more dry than I would have liked to, uh, reducing overhead. Absolutely. Um, and this really came with the pandemic. We got rid of the space. I, I actually made a decision not to be in my space prior to that. Um, and was switching my patients to coming online because I was doing group medical visits around uh, burnout and concussion prior. Much easier for me to do that in person, but with the pandemic, absolutely we couldn't do that. And so I um, I switched to working online, which ended up being much better even for my concussion patients because they didn't have to travel. And prior to that, yeah, I was doing these group medical visits and I was servicing the province through OTN. So um, patients from like, you know, Sudbury and Dryden were coming in uh, to our group visit. That was it was kind of synchronous at the time. So they'd be coming in on OTN. And then when we moved um, with the pandemic, we moved online and it was actually easier for everybody to hear and participate. And um, yeah, so that's how my model changed. I renovated my basement um, and I have a yoga studio set up there to do my work. Oh, yeah. that's amazing. And then did you also like change your CPSO and CMPA coverage as well? I can't remember with CMPA. Um, I think so. The thing with the CMPA is I think it was still because uh, I was at that time doing family practice psychotherapy. So that was a different premium anyway. Right. Um, and then because I was doing yoga therapy, I did need to purchase uh, yoga therapy insurance. Oh. and. And, and enough yoga therapy insurance. So I actually have two policies of yoga therapy insurance because I have to be insured at a certain level. And both, you know, CMPA is like, we only cover medical and the yoga therapy is like, we're not cu- touching anything medical. So if anything happens, I imagine there's going to be a fight between them um, in terms of p- p- whatever right. they're insuring. But, um, but yeah, so that actually went up a little bit. I switched my EMR from like, because medical EMRs, the alar- electronic medical chart, they're very expensive. They yes. charge a lot. You know, it's like 350 to 400 a month for a good one. And I didn't need that. So, and at the time when I was, you know, when I was working, we all used one in the clinic. So we used one that was at the time uh, verified by Ontario, Ontario MD, which is uh, the organization that's kind of helping foster uh, electronic electronicization of mm-hmm. our charting and our communication. Um, but you don't need to have one that's... Um, verified by them. It just has to be secure. HIPAA, FIPA, and PIPA secure. Those are the three securities we have to have. So I ended up using one that a dietitian uses, uh, which is $70, $79 a month. I think it's $89 a month now. So that was a significant saving. Um, I don't have, uh, I have a virtual assistant who helps me with booking patients and she she's loving that part. She also does other things for other people, but so I'm kind of time sharing that. I pay her an hourly rate and I do my own billing through, uh, I think it's MD billing, Dr. Bill, one of those. There's there a lot of those. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and that's kind of, I've streamlined some of that and I've streamlined how I deliver my course as well. So I, it's a, for the medical course in concussion, I have a course platform as part of my EMR. So my patients can listen to the course during the week um, which is easier on them because they often are fatigued or have headaches. So they, you know, sitting for a full group medical visit can be hard. And then when we meet together, most of them have had at least listened to the material. 
or read it because they can either read or listen. And we do a practice and then we do group um, a group discussion. And, you know, I talk about the medical aspects of recovery and what they may need. So that's kind of how I evolved my practice. And I actually really like the model. Uh, I really hope the OMA brings back group medical visits because in family practice, so uh, around 2010, we started to do them with our diabetes, our chronic illness, our well babies. And it was such a great use of time. It freed up my schedule for, you know, I thought it was going to help me with dealing with the depressed people won't get as depressed, but what it ended up doing is like kind of the well, the worried well, and the people who are just regular people coming in for a checkup, they came to the group visits. You could spot who needed more care. They would come after. And it was, instead of repeating everything you said all day, it just really helped focus care so that um, yeah, so that uh, you provide, you got to provide everything. I absolutely loved it. And the patients helped each other out. They supported each other. You know, the evidence shows that we heal in connection. It's true. Loneliness, our, our pain center is the same center as our loneliness center. So when we can connect people, we can reduce their chronic pain. It's, it, it's such a beautiful model. So I'm hopeful that medicine is going to change and we're going to be able to do these things. And, and I'm hopeful that as I get better, I can still influence that aspect of it. I might not be able to do patient care as much, but I can still um, uh, teach people and influence stuff. But again, that it depends on the season. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And so just because um, we touched on this a little bit already about the process of you starting up the yoga MD, but you have like a website, you said, you said you do like these group sessions, you have patients. Um, you know, what was it, what does it feel like to be like that type of small business owner and, and starting up this, this business, what was some obstacles for you? Yeah. So, um, there's a couple things there. I absolutely love it. I wouldn't do anything else at this stage of my career. It comes at a financial cost to, to, because I'm figuring out the process. When you're one of the first ones, you have to figure out the process. Um, I have a group of physicians who are doing similar work. So we lean on each other for support because when you're kind of doing a different model of care, you can, and people don't necessarily get what it is you're doing, right? So you do need a group of people. Uh, but I would say it, it, the five years before I hit my head, I took a financial cut to do this. And that actually affected my disability insurance because it looked like I was making a lot less money than what I was making. So in that sense, you know, if I had just come from family practice, I probably would have had been making more, but I'm a happy person, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's not always about the money, right? Like some people yeah. will, yeah, they'll yeah. do something for, for less money, but it actually brings them a lot of happiness. And so it sounds to me like it was very self-funded um, and yeah, you had to go out on your own to find clients or patients um, yourself. You had to advertise essentially, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there was a group around, like there was a family doctor. Uh, it was a FIG, a family health group at the time that was setting up. So they were just setting up. So they were sending me everyone, which oh, was wow. great. So yeah. I, I, it was good that way. Um, the way, so this is where the politics and the red tape can get into it. As a family doctor, if somebody is a patient of a family health organization, this is in Ontario, if they see another family doctor, their family doctor will get negated for yes. them coming to see me. So I had to get GP psychotherapy status um, so that I wouldn't negate the other doctor. And there's a lot of politics still around that. They were trying to get rid of GP psychotherapy status. A lot of family doctors were switching to this during the pandemic, haven't gotten that yet. Um, but, you know, that's where I hope you know, in my off time, when I'm not great to see patients writing letters and advocating for what it is we do and teaching people what it is we do is really important. And the network, I feel like, is, you know, um, I was, I started off as an eMERGE doc. I know people in Ottawa. Some of those people are now on the OMA ne negotiation thing. So one of my things today is to write a letter to one of the negotiators about group medical visits and why we need to bring those codes back. And um, what I'm accepting is this is my job. So, because the thing about being on disability, nobody, you know, and you, you'll see this with your patients, like it's depressing to not be working, especially somebody as a doctor. I don't want to say, oh, it was my identity, but it was definitely what I did. And it gave the, the most wonderful thing about being a doctor, and I'll say this even in burnout, um, is there's no other job like it. You can try to do other things, but pushing paper just isn't the same. When you're helping somebody every 15, 20 minutes, you're saving a life or it, there's, it gives you a sense of purpose that even when the burnout is there, um, as you recover from the burnout, you still kind of want that type of work or that type of environment. So, um, 
being on disability has been really hard in that, you know, I, I feel, and I'm blessed for what it is I do because I can still work at it. And if I didn't have something to work on, that would cause that my symptoms would definitely be worse. And I would be more depressed about the situation, but because I have the yoga MD and so many little projects, it, it, um, it makes me feel good. And you sounds like you I have an assistant as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it sounds to me like you have an assistant that helps you as well. But I saw that, you know, you have this whole platform, right? You have several social media around the Yoga MD. You have a website around it. Did you build that all yourself or did you yeah. have people helping you? Um, so I, when I was off after the um, being locked out, I learned how to build a website on Wix. And then um, then we had to change it a couple of times. I now have my website on a Canadian server because if whatever happens, if I get sued, I want to be in Canada. So um, I built a, I hired somebody to do a WordPress website and I did hired somebody to do the reconnect concussion website as well. But these past couple of weeks, I actually rebuilt my own yoga MD website using Elementor and uh, WordPress. So um, yeah, I, and I actually just love the creativity of it. So I did yeah. build one that you're seeing now, if you look at it is one that I built, it's not perfect, not perfect, but it's, it's getting there. Yeah. Oh, it's very <laughs> impressive. It's always, you're always learning all the time and you're learning different skills, new skills. And it's great to see that you're able to bring that creativity back into your life. Um, yeah. so just out of curiosity, my, my last question is, you know, sometimes yoga can get a bad rep in physician and resident circles, especially when we're mandated to do it as part of some wellness session. So yeah. in your experience, what are some principles from yoga um, for people who are burned out in their career? Yeah. So you've just brought up a huge point. And what one of, um, first of all, yoga is a process. It's a process for clearing the mind. So it's not just the postures and the breathing. It's so much more than that. It's actually Eastern psychology. And that's the part that I bring it back to. I bring it back to that root of releasing stress in the body and building clarity around what it is, who you actually are. My biggest beef with yoga and the wellness industry, especially as hospitals try to get you to do this, is they'll do it at lunchtime. And I can tell you there's not a yogi in the history of yoga that has done yoga at lunch instead of eating. So, you know, yoga is about taking care of yourself. So either do it in the morning, do it before, you know, when you need a break, but not when you should really be um, coming into community with the people with whom you work or taking that break during the day, um, unless you want to go and eat and then go meditate or eat mindfully or, or what have you. But my biggest beef with people who appropriate yoga into the wellness industry, and I'll use that word, um, is that their their intention is not right. Um, and, and when the intention isn't correct, the practice won't be correct. So the problem in our healthcare system right now is all of us are overworked. We're overstretched. There's not enough of us to provide the care. There's no surge capacity in the system. It doesn't matter how much yoga you do. If you're working in a toxic environment, you will, it's, it's not going to help. And I remember when I was working at the family practice where, from where I got locked out, I remember, um, walking to this used bookstore, I saw this book on the shelf, I ended up buying it, it was the Dalai Lama. And it was, he wrote a book called The Art of Happiness. And he adapted that book for the art of happiness at work. And I remember I took this book off the um, the shelf, I opened it up to see what he said about what if you what if you're working in a, in a bad workplace, how do you deal? Because I was like, oh, he's a meditator, I just have to find that Zen place where everything will be okay. And like, it was like page 39 or page 34 or something. If you're in a bad environment that's not supporting your health and it's toxic, you must leave. This is what the Dalai Lama said. And it was like, yes. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what I think is that it, yoga works for us when it's our personal thing. But if we're working in a toxic environment or unsupported environment, it's not the solution that's going to help. It may help us personally, but if we're keeping going back into that toxic or or um, overworked environment where we're experiencing moral distress, where we're not supported, there's no amount of yoga that will fix that, right? That is management figuring out that they need to hire more people to, to cover the workload. Yeah, and I completely agree. So just going to move on to five rapid fire questions. Uh, question number one, uh, what is your best investment? My house, okay. luckily for me, um, I bought, uh, you know, that was an age fluke thing. Okay. Bought, right. Cool. Yeah. And what was your worst investment? I don't know. That's okay. <laughs> you asked me this That's and I had a hard one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what is a charitable cause you're passionate about? 
Oh my God, I'm so passionate about brain injury recovery uh, right now. Um, I'm passionate for Doctors Without Borders and the work that they do, uh, and any like uh, the food banks and the uh, there's an organization in my neighborhood called the Stop Community Food Center. Um, again, they bring people in to learn how to cook. They grow their own vegetables. I'm so passionate about those types of community organizations getting things done on the ground. Well, that's wonderful. And what is a favorite travel destination? I am a traveler, so I like going anywhere and everywhere. Uh, my favorite was actually as a medical student, I went to Brazil uh, as a, an exchange student. And just top of my list, Brazilians are the most... Um, they are the most joyful people and uh, their culture is amazing. And I absolutely love that, that trip. So that's yeah. wonderful. And finally, uh, what is a piece of marriage or relationship advice you can give us? Oh, you know, it's, it's, this is a really hard profession and you need to pick your partner wisely, someone who respects you. Um, I think it's a little bit harder for the women not to be rude. Um, I think the men can get taken as well by some gold diggers, but uh, for the women, especially, there's going to be times where work trumps your relationship. It may not trump your children or your family, but, and that can be really hard on your partner. And you, you really want to kind of leave work behind when you walk in the door. And if that's some kind of ritual, some breathing ritual or something that you have to do, writing something that when you actually have that moment reconnecting with your partner, that it's about you and them and your relationship and not you know, not everything that work has brought for you that day. Exactly. Yeah. And it's just like they say, you don't want to be married to your work, but divorced at home, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so that's, thank you so much for your time in speaking with me. And that was the Yoga MD. If you want to learn more about Dr. Vadia's work, you can find her at the yogamd.ca. And if you have any questions for her, please leave a comment below. And thanks for listening.